are joining with audiences from across the globe to enjoy Harrogate International Festival's series of online events, streamed straight from our home to yours. Sit back, relax, and enjoy an interview with Val McDermott as part of the Thigston Old Peculiar Crime Writing Festival. We promise you've got the best seats in the house. Hello, welcome to the Harrogate International Crime Writing Festival for 2020, which, like so many things at the moment, is online. The locked room used to be a subgenre of uh, crime fiction, but now is the way that so many of us live. Um, so I'm in one locked room in London, in another in Edinburgh is Val McDermott, uh, who is one of the uh, key figures and founding figures of the uh, Crime Writing Festival. And we're going to talk particularly about um, New Blood, which is something that Val has been running for um, 16, 17 years now. And uh, she selects for um, new books each year. Uh, and we'll talk about that. Um, but Val, uh, welcome in our, from our locked rooms to each other. Um, everything now, and it's the reason we're talking in the way that we are, um, is dominated by coronavirus, COVID-19. Um, I thought I'd start with the literary impact, because um, if, and it's a big if for many people, um, if you're lucky enough to avoid illness, bereavement, or poverty or economic problems. Um, it's actually, lockdown has been very good for writing and reading, hasn't it? It's, it, 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 it's made both um, easier to do. Well, I think it's probably made reading easier. I'm not convinced at all that it's made writing easier. Um, I've, I've written my, my usual book this year in lockdown period, and it took me slightly longer than it normally would, probably about, probably about four weeks longer than it would have taken me. I found it very hard to focus for long periods of time, I have to say. And, and towards the end of the book, I always speed up. And towards the end of the book, I often find myself writing 4,000 words a day or something of that order. But I think the most I got through in a day this time around was, was a couple of thousand. Uh, I, think, I think we're all enduring a kind of low-level thrum of anxiety that uh, means that every now and again you have to check your emails or check your Twitter, check whatever way you have of staying in touch with the people you love that are not with you to make sure everything's still all right with them. And we had, I think, a, a mild version of the, the virus quite early on. We were both quite poorly for about seven days. And then we had the, the brain fog and the exhaustion for a bit after that. And every now and again, we have one of those days where the brain just doesn't work and all you want to do is lie about. So it's, yeah, it's been good for reading, I think. And that ultimately is good for writers because it means people are buying more books. But in terms of the creativity, I think it's been a bit of, a, of, of an uphill push. That's really, that's really interesting, the, the psychological effects of it. Um, we have to sometimes be slightly wary of these surveys because we don't know what the sample are, but there, there is a survey that showed that um, I think it's about 25 to 28% of people have said that they've changed their reading habits in lockdown and they're reading more crime, mystery and thriller fiction. Um, I found that interesting because, I mean, it's a conversation we've had in many different ways in Harrogate on many sessions, but people see... They say that in bad times people want escapism, but then you get into the sub question of that, which is, is crime fiction escapism or not? It's the sort of escapism that helps you to confront your fears, I think, isn't it? Yes, I think so. And I always remember talking to P.D. James about this, and we, we, we both agreed that there's a sort of consolation in reading crime fiction, because although terrible, terrible things happen, there are people like Adam Dalgleish, like Tony and Carol, like Karen Perry, who are out there to put things right as, as far as they can be put right. Um, so there is a kind of, uh, I suppose, a feeling of lightning striking someone else's house. Uh, you, feel, you feel the compassion, you feel, you feel empathy, but you also think, thank God that's not me. I, and you mentioned um, P.D. James and the way she wrote, uh, I was thinking the way she wrote so vividly about um, London and also um, about Suffolk. Um, I wondered about it, if people are reading more, it's part of this crime fiction is, it's a form of travel, isn't it? Because um, all, pretty much all successful crime fiction, certainly series, is very geographically based. There's, there's a location. And I've certainly found that. I mean, if you're not able to go out, <laughs> except for your daily active exercise, um, it's very exciting to read a book about, you know, set in America or India or where, wherever. 
Yeah, I think ty- uh, the novel, the fiction generally, but crime fiction in particular, is a kind of time machine. It takes you forward and back in time, and it takes you through space as well. So for the duration of, of your reading, you are transported somewhere else. Now, that can be somewhere you've never been, or it can be somewhere that you're familiar with, and it's it's like a sort of almost like a comfort blanket of revisiting Tuscany or, or revisiting Edinburgh, places that you love, that you can go back to in your memory. And I think it's, it's definitely the case that for a long time, uh, place has been a really important part, an element in crime fiction and the books that I, I think stick with me most are the ones that have that that strong sense of place you know writers like Sarah Paretsky with Chicago and a much more modern context someone like Will Dean who's writing about the depths of the Swedish forest uh, uh, these are these are vivid places that stay in your head and when you visit them for the first time you go like ah oh, yes I've been here before uh, and it's a kind of trick that we play on the readers Um, because really everybody knows that crimes are not solved the way we write about them in our books, because the reality is is dull, it's tedious, it's knocking on doors, it's asking the same question again and again and again, it's waiting for the forensics to come back from the lab. And so if we actually wrote that, nobody would get past past page three. Uh, But if we write vividly about a real place, or even an imagined place, in such a way that the reader is transported and they believe in that place, then they tend to believe all the lies we tell them. Mm. Very interesting. And I am um, one of the books I, I was reading an Ian Rankin that I hadn't read uh, was one of my lockdown reads. And it's exactly as you suggest, because um, every August, astonishingly, I mean, I think for 35 years, every August, I've come to the Edinburgh Festival, yeah. and then the Edinburgh Book Festival for many more. And I hadn't, stupidly, hadn't really seen this coming, but there's actually some, something quite upsetting about reading about a place that you normally go to, but you can't go to. Yeah, I think um, I think we're all uh, all of us who are regular attendees at the, any of the Edinburgh festivals are really feeling it at the moment because you know so so many of my friends I only I, I see once a year in Edinburgh we'd like to to be reunited we go out and have a meal or we go for a drink we sit in the yurt in, in Charlotte Square at the book festival and, and catch up. It's not that we're, we're not friends, it's not that our friendship doesn't persist, but that's the place where it's, it's re-cemented every year, if you like. And also, there's a, a practical thing of going to other people's events, whether it's book events or, or theatre events or comedy. You, you hear things, you see things that stimulate your own thought processes. You, you learn other people's tricks. Uh, you think of another way of doing something or even an idea that you suddenly think, I could use that, but what if this instead of that? So it's also part of the creative process coming together with all these other creative people. And it's lovely, of course, to be with readers. And that's the thing that I'm also missing is is contact with people who read the books. It's one of the great joys of Harrogate in particular, because that's such a a social and, and democratic festival. Well, I was going to say, because we're, we're going to really miss Edinburgh in August. We're really missing Harrogate in July, although this is yeah. a version of it. Um, but again, there, there are people that I only ever see in Harrogate once a year. So this year I won't see them. So it's all part of the, um, of the process. I'll, I'll miss the jibes about Wraith Rovers this year. I know. <laughs> well, no, funny enough, I almost wore it, but I didn't. I, um, I, I have one of the, um, well, we should explain for people who don't know that uh, Val McDermott, um, is sponsors Wraith Rovers and she's on the shirts and I have a shirt with Val McDermott on so I was going to wear it but I hope you wear it it proudly on many occasions I have but it's not laundered so I thought I'd um (laughs) because I I, I wore it when I went running the other day and so I thought I wouldn't inflict it on the um yeah the digital uh audience um so we'll talk about your Harrogate choice in a moment last real COVID related question because it's obviously what all writers are talking about online and um, on Zoom and so on. Um, and you must have thought about this. Are, are we going to see a subgenre of COVID crime fiction in which police are walking around with masks and so on? Probably, but I'm not uh, going to be one of those writers. I think it's too close. Uh, I think something like this one, one needs perspective. And also, it's very hard to write in the here and now when the here and now is changing on a daily basis. Uh, so I think uh, my, my new book, and it's coming out in August, Still Life, is a Karen Pirrie, which was always going to be set in February 2020. Uh, and so that, that I, I dodged that bullet. Uh, so I think the next book might take us back in time a little. And that's, um, I mean, it's all part of the things that writers have to tussle with. Um, we, we know there were various... Uh, 
well, there are novels that were coming out this year that in, that involved the Olympics, um, which now aren't happening. Uh, famously, there were novels that um, assumed that Hillary Clinton was going to win the presidency in 2016, and she didn't. We now, at the moment, actually, we have two literary novels which imagine that she did win, which is a slightly different thing. But yeah, you have to be so careful. Now, what I was thinking about is people like Mark Billingham, um, Ian Rankin, our friends, who write in real time. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, one of the amazing things about, you know, reading Ian's books now backwards is you get the whole move towards you know, the Scottish independence debate and so on. It'd be quite hard to ignore if you write in um, in the present day. Yes, I think so. I mean, which is why, as I say, I'm, which I'm probably going to step away from it. I think it's hard to ignore, but I think it's going to be very hard to do well. Uh, I think there will probably be quite a lot of bad COVID novels. Uh, as, as always happens when people jump on a passing bandwagon, I think I think it's always better to, to let things have a little bit of time to digest. And although the Karen Pirries are kind of written in real time in the sense that they reflect real events, um, I, I don't want to dive into the, the middle of uh, Karen walking about Edinburgh with a, with a visor. And, and uh, I mean, I think in, in the, 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 the reality is that uh, uh, Karen's unit would probably be temporarily disbanded and she'd be put back on the streets <laughs> cleaning the parks, which doesn't really make for a great I novel. <laughs> I can see that. And then the other thing that's happened to two writers, uh, one rather better at the genre than the other, I think, but Peter May and Stanley Johnson, whose son went into politics, um, mm -hmm. they'd both written a long time ago uh, contagion or virus novels and then, then they've come back into print but regardless of what we think of those um, novels and I say I think the Peter May one's uh, much better but um, that is something spooky about fiction isn't it that uh, fiction often gets there before the fact. Yeah well I actually did a, a, a three-part radio serial for Radio 4 back in 2017 called Resistance which is about precisely that. It's about a global pandemic, uh, and it's, it's 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 basically an apocalypse. So I I, I wrote it in, as part of the, the scheme that the Wellcome Trust does. Every year they bring together writers and radio producers and scientists, and they choose a particular theme. And that year the theme was antimicrobial resistance. And I listened to Sally Davis, who at the time was the chief medical officer, uh, telling us the realities of antimicrobial resistance. You know, the drugs won't work. Uh, and all I could think of was, was to write an apocalypse. So I went away and did that. And it's in the process of being transformed into a graphic novel. Um, <laughs> my publisher is, 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 I can see them swithering about, is this the best time or is this the worst time to be publishing this? Um, so we shall see when that, when that finally appears. And if the virus had happened then, then Sally Davis would be as famous as Professor Chris Whitty is now. Yes. Um, so, yeah, you, you never know these things happen. But the reason that happens of people writing terrible things before they happen is that it's one of the things that writers do is to imagine the worst, catastrophizing it yes. in, in a psychological context. Yes, I think so. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things that, that always makes us go, what if? Hmm. What if this were to happen? How would it play out? Um, and again, a couple of years back, I, I adapted uh, John Wyndham's novel, The Kraken Wakes, uh, and I updated that to the present day. Uh, and of course, at the heart of that is these, uh, these creatures from outer space. We never see them because they're at the depths of the deepest ocean, but the seawater levels rise and rise and rise inexorably. And of course, here we are looking at a, a possibility of, of, of the kind of climate change that will do just that. Uh, so that was interesting to uh, imagine how that would play out. Uh, and of course, in the UK, because of the tilt of the UK, uh, Scotland survives, but most of England doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, 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 that's the geology of it. I'm not just making this up, you know. Hey, geology rather than politics, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Although it would have a political advantage because you'd all survive, so... Yes, indeed. Um, so let's um, say New Blood, which um, started uh, 2003, 2004, I think, yeah. is when, you, when you started it. Um, now, first of all, tremendous puns. So um, New Blood, uh, which is new bloody crime fiction. Um, so uh, how did it come about initially, New Blood? Well, when we were planning what this festival was going to be uh, in its earliest days, we had certain things we had in mind. We wanted it to be the best of crime fiction, not just the best sellers of crime fiction. So we knew we would always like be aiming for, for some 
household names to attract people's attention to the festival. But what we also wanted to do was, was to cover a broad ground. We wanted to have all sorts of crime writers that we thought were really good at their craft. So right from the beginning, for example, we said we wanted it to have an international dimension. And one of the things we also wanted to do was to introduce the audience to writers they might not have come across. And that involved a whole focus also on debut writers. Uh, the kind of people who we thought were going to come to a crime writing festival were probably people who were already reading a lot of crime fiction. So the chances are they would have read all my books, they would have read all Sarah Koretsky, they'd have read all Ian Rankin's. Uh, we wanted to be, present them with, here's something fresh, here's something different. Here's something new to get your teeth into. Uh, and so that's where the idea for, for New Blood was, was born. Um, and every year it gets a huge audience. It's, it's one of the events that sells out quicker than anything else because the people who come to this festival are fans. These are people who are often reading two, three more books in a week. They love this genre and they want to be right out there at the leading edge, but they want to see what, what writers who are coming to us for the first time are doing, what their concerns are and, and how they're expressing themselves. So right from the start, we said this, is, this has got to be part of the festival. And um, some people watching, as many people will know what Harrogate is, but the point you make there is very striking to me that um, we come to your session in Harrogate and there's first time writers, but then at another session, it can be John Grisham, I mean, the really the seriously big names, Sarah Perevsky, um, Robert Galbraith, also known as um, J.K. Rowling, uh, turn up on you. And I mean, a presidential kind of level of um, attention and crowds and security and so on. Um, so it, that, that is the amazing thing. As you say, it's that balance. Um, people you've never heard of that might become very big and people who are incredibly big. Yeah, I think um, it's, it's also because at the heart of it, we've, we, we did this right from the start, I mean, uh, in a way. I'd been involved with other festivals before that had not been uh, backed up, if you like, by an infrastructure. And expecting crime writers to organise things like people's hotel bookings and travel, I mean, you know, forget it. We can barely organise ourselves getting out of bed in the morning. Uh, and so in the past, festivals had kind of started quite well with a lot of energy, but then people had got fed up with always having to do the nuts and bolts, and they just didn't really work in the long term. The great advantage with, with the Harrogate Festival was that we already had an infrastructure. There was already an international music and dance festival here in Harrogate. There were administrators, there were people who could sort out all the nuts and bolts. So we could just, the programming committee could just sort out the programming. Uh, and between us, we had fairly impressive address books. Um, because over the years, you know, we, we, I'd, I've been all over the place uh, in, in, in other countries and uh, at festivals all over the place. And I've met a lot of people and become friends with a lot of people. So, you know, the first year we, we, we sat around the table and said, who do you know? And we actually kicked off the, the, the very first festival with Colin Dexter because uh, I, I got in touch with Colin and said, will you do me a favour? <laughs> Uh, and he did. He came along and he did the first event and he was there for the weekend and he was delightful and everybody loved him and he got off to a great start. Um, so you, there's always that need to have some starry names, but the, the, I say the, the thrust of the festival has always been about showcasing the best of crime writing. And the selection process of New Blood, um, I've always been interested in this because, as you know, there are actually quite a lot of writers who won't read fiction when they're writing fiction because they're worried about uh, taking on the style or the plot of somebody else, uh, the risk of imitation. Um, you, you, you can't be in that category because you clearly read so much crime fiction every year. Yeah, well, I mean, and I read other fiction too. Um, I, I feel very secure in the voices in my head. Um, I don't feel that uh, Karen Puri or, or Tony and Carol or whoever else I'm writing is going to be contaminated by, by what I'm reading. It's like a separate compartment in my head. Um, you know, I read uh, and I'm in that world and then I come back to sit down and write and I'm in that world. Um, I, I know what Karen Perry sounds like. I, I, uh, in the same way that when I think about my friends, I, I, I know what their voices sound like. I know the kind of things they say. So I'm not worried about that contamination and I'm quite happy to sit down and, and work my way through uh, the between 50 and 70 debut novels that come my way over the course of the year. 
mostly they come through the, the submission process via the festival, but others are, are ones that I kind of stumble upon in the course of my reading or the course of books that publishers send me. And sometimes friends recommend something that they've, they've read that hasn't somehow made its way to me by another route. So I'm very open-minded about where the books come from. Um, and I'm not going to tell a lie here and say I read every word of every one of those 70 odd books because that would be uh, ridiculous. Um, but I, I, I know very specifically what I'm looking for. And if things uh, don't match up, and there's a lot of books that come out every year that, that are, are perfectly fine in their way, but don't do anything that excites me. So I'm afraid they get put to one side. And then I focus on the ones that really uh, do excite me. And that usually whittles down to about a dozen or so. And then I work my way through them with close attention and choose the four that I'm going to go with. And there, there's a small, as you know, a, a little subgenre of crime fiction in which um, a famous writer is sent um, a manuscript by an unknown. And it's so good that they kill the writer um, and publish it under, the, under their own name. Um, I'm not suggesting for a moment, but um, the more benign side of that, which is, if someone has a stunning plot or a stunning plot twist, um, y you never worry about thinking, ooh, I might have to, um, I mean, subconsciously or consciously, I might have to take that. No, I don't think so. Um, I've, I've always been of the view that uh, if you gave six crime writers an identical storyline, you'd get six completely different novels. Uh, and, and that's kind of borne out historically. Sometimes uh, events happen. Uh, some years ago, there was a big drought and lots of villages started to emerge from reservoirs. And mm. the following year, there were, I think, four different crime novels, all based around what happens when the village re-emerges. And they were all completely different. Including the great Reginald Hill. Indeed. On, yes, on, on Beulah Heights. Beulah Heights. Astonishing novel, that, I think. I still think that is the, the perfect crime novel. Mm. I I go back to it regularly. I, I think it's, it's wonderful. It just, just the hairs on my neck go up just thinking about it. It's wonderful. It's a, it's a wonderfully written book. It's this great elegy of love and loss and tremendous evocation of place. And of course, at the heart of it, you've got D.L. and Pasco being D.L. and Pasco. And it's, it's just, it's fabulous. But, um, but there is that uh, thing. I, I mean, I've, I've, I, I'm honest, honestly, I come to these books like a reader. Um, if a book excites me, I want to share it. Um, you know, I am that, that person who corners you at a drinks party and says, I've just read this amazing book. <laughs> um, uh, because I, 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 I'm excited by books. And so when I, I find these new voices that I think have, have something different and special to say, I want, I want to share them. I want other people to enjoy them too. Um, and I don't think I've ever, I mean, there are moments where I think, oh, I wish I'd done that, I wish I'd thought of that. But I don't think I've ever actually lifted anything consciously. Um, <laughs> though, of course... They are of, of books that you read if you're a writer are trigger points for ideas because yeah. you think that's interesting. Now, if if you looked at that through the other end of the telescope, or if you just gave that a wee twist, it would be a different picture. And that's those are often the the points where you start thinking about the possibilities of a novel. I was just thinking there it's a bit of a tangent, but nothing is tangential to um, readers of crime fiction because they know so many books. But when you, when you were talking about writer yeah, writers treating the same subject. Um, there's an interesting case in Scotland, isn't, isn't there? The Bible John case, which many, many writers yeah. um, have approached and written quite different books. Yes, indeed. And I mean, the, 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 the interesting thing at the heart of Bible John is that it's entirely possible that, that Bible John never existed in, in a sense, that there was never a serial killer, that there were just um, a couple of murders that, that looked very similar and another one that could be tied into it. So, but it, but it, had, it was something that, uh, that became a huge spectre in Scotland in the 1960s. I mean, I, I remember as a, as a child being told, you know, don't stay out after dark or Bible John will get you. Hmm. It, was, it became a bogeyman in the popular imagination in the way that the, the Yorkshire Ripper did later, yeah. except that in that case, you really were at risk if you were a yeah. woman. No, absolutely. And yeah, Denise Miner has done, uh, has written about it, and um, Ian Rankin, I mean, se several, several writers have done yeah. it. Yeah, and Liam McIlvany and... Yeah, of yeah. course, Liam McIlvany, yeah, yeah. Um, well, that'd be a good, um, yes, if there are students around, that would be a good thesis for someone. They could put all, <laughs> the, all the Bible John books together, it'd be interesting. Um, and the question of representation, which is obviously much in the air at the moment, um, that is something you've had to think about. Um, I mean, I know we all say when we judge these things, it's the best books, but if you ended up with the four best books being by four white men, um, 
it's problematic, isn't it? So you, you do have to think about getting a range of voices in. Yeah, I think the, the very process of the, that I go through with, with New Blood is, is wanting to bring a diverse range of books to the, to the, the audience. Uh, there wouldn't be any great point in me coming up with four private eye novels set in, in Los Angeles uh, because that wouldn't really give much sense of here's what's happening in contemporary crime fiction. But at the same time, uh, I'm quite rigorous about the books and having to earn their place on the list. Uh, nobody gets on the list because of the colour of their skin or, or their gender. They get on the list because their book is a really good read. Um, and it is something, I mean, to be perfectly honest, with, with most book festivals, what they're most concerned with is not uh, the gender or, or the, the, the racial makeup of the panel. It's making sure you get the balance of the publishers right so you don't offend any of the sponsors. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the diversity has a slightly different feel to it. Um, but no, no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm always, that's, that's why I try to cast my net as widely as possible so that I get a sense of the different kinds of voices that are coming through. And uh, that's, you know, all, all I will say is I'm, I'm looking for four really good books. Um, and you know, sometimes I come across a book that I really love personally. And I, and I don't take to the New Blood panel because I think this is probably a book that doesn't have a huge wider appeal. It's a kind of niche that I like it because I'm me. Right. Um, so again, that's something that, that I have to set to one side. It's not just about my personal taste, because sometimes my personal taste can be a bit uh, niche, as I say. Hmm. Uh, so I, I, I try to, to balance what's really good with what I think will find an audience as well. And that's an experience we've all had, where we say to one of our friends or family, you must read this, it's so brilliant, and then you find it hurled across the room with page four, <laughs> page yeah. four turned down. And it just does happen, because taste is very personal. Yes, I mean, there was a book, a, a book I read last year that I was just blown away by and I was so excited by it. And I gave it to my partner, Free. I said, you know, like, you will lo you'll love this, it's fantastic. And she got about 20 pages in and said, I don't know what, I don't know what you're so excited about. <laughs> you know, so uh, that's something, again, that I kind of bear in mind when I'm, I'm reading The New Blood. I want something that speaks to me, that has all these fine qualities, but that I also think will speak to a wider room. And we all... Get to the four choices this year, which um, are very, very exciting, very varied. Um, last general question before we do that, because these are, these are debut novels. And so are you, the balance of judging achievement versus promise, i.e. what they've done and what they will go on to, that's something you have to think about. Yeah, and it's something I can't entirely quantify. Um, I'm, I'm looking, what I'm looking for, essentially, is somebody who can tell a good story someone who writes well, someone who creates characters that I remember when the book's closed. But there's also a kind of um, ineffable quality of, as you say, promise. There's a sense that there's a writer here who is excited about what they're doing and has more to say. Uh, and it's, it's difficult to um, explain what that is. And I, and I think it's one of those uh, alchemical things that you just, you know when it's there and you know when it's not there. Um, and, you know, I think on, on balance, uh, I've been proved more right than wrong on that front, <laughs> that uh, the people that have come through the, the New Blood panel have, have mostly gone on to continue their careers in an upward trajectory, um, and that's very gratifying. But, uh, you know, that, again, as I say, that's something that, that's uh, really difficult to put your finger on, but a sense of there's more to come here. This is someone who's got more to say. And the obverse of that is we've all read, without naming names, we've read first novels by people and thought, that's the book they've got in them. And there are, there, there are careers like that. Yes. And, you know, one or two of them have, have passed through this panel. Um, you know, they've written a, a, a stunning debut novel and uh, have subsequently gone on either to write nothing much more or to disappoint. Mm -hmm. And that's that's... That's the risk you take. I suppose it's the risk I take. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I don't think of it as getting egg on my face. I think of it as just going like, okay, well, that was one book and it was terrific. They just didn't have the legs. Look at all the other people who have come through this and gone on to really build. One of the reasons your panel is so popular every year, apart from you and your choices, is it's slightly unusual. Um, often in Harrogate, the books haven't yet been published because they're coming out in September, October. There are advanced copies there. 
with these, they're generally available. So the books we're about to talk about, people will be yes. uh, able to uh, go and read these now. The first one is Jessica Moore's book, Keeper. Mm -hmm. And this is quite, um, a, quite, quite a common uh, crime plot, which is the assumed suicide, which wasn't, and it gradually becomes clear that it wasn't. However, the, um, I don't want to say twist, the extra element here is um, that it uses it to explore domestic violence. Yeah, I'm just going to hold it up so people can see it. This is a proof copy. All the ones I've got are proofs because I read them so far in advance. Um, and yeah, and at the heart of this is, is domestic violence, coercive control. These are things that have been in the headlines, that things have been uh, written about and, and spoken about in, in a, a, a journalistic or, or a non-fiction sense. But to see this dealt with uh, so evocatively and so subtly in, in a novel, I think is really exciting. It's a very powerful book. Uh, and I'm, I mean, I'm, there's actually a blurb from me on, on the back of it because I, I read it at a much earlier stage. And I said, it made me want to shout out in anger. And this is a book that, that, that will fill you with pity and with rage and with sorrow. Uh, and, and, um, and I think it's an extraordinary uh, emotional engagement to, to generate with the first novel, as well as being a really good you know, police procedural. It's, I, I, I really enjoyed this book, uh, and, and it's about an important subject, and it does it really well. And it doesn't preach, and it doesn't, it doesn't become um, a, a polemic. It doesn't get on a soapbox. It actually conveys its points within the, the context of telling a bloody good story. And that's what you're always looking for as well. You're looking for something where story is at the heart of it. Story and character. Um, suspense and, and storytelling, I mean, always come down to character. Uh, if you don't care about the characters, there's no suspense. Mm. You know, I often say to, to when, if, I'm, if I'm teaching at all, I say, you know, a car goes over a cliff. So what? Unless you care about who's in the car or who's at the bottom of the cliff, it's meaningless. There's no suspense. So it, it always comes down to character that we're interested in, whose fate concerns us. And this book is, is, um, is full of that. It moves backwards and forwards in time. Uh, and we get a real insight into uh, life in a refuge, for example, uh, and as well as the police investigation. And I think it's uh, an absolute cracker. The other thing that writers envy, apart from other writers' plots, is other writers' titles. And Keeper is brilliant because it has that astonishing double meaning that people say of someone they've met, I think this one's a keeper. But of course, in this context, it has that meaning of coercive control. Yeah. Kept by a man. It's a it's, it's brilliant title. Yes, it's very clever. Um, that sense of being in a cage. Mm. Uh, mm. And, and also the, the, the other sense, I think, of, uh, of the gamekeeper stalking mm. their prey. Mm. So it's got all these, these, these layers of meaning. Very clever. Yes, mm. yes. And um, among Val's other accomplishments, she's in a rock band. And so she, she's aware of the, as we all are, that there's a, the concept album, which is a very 70s thing, um, in rock, but they're also concept novels. And Elizabeth Kay's Seven Lies, there have been various um, crime novels and a, a very famous movie called Seven based around the Seven Deadly Sins. Mm. But this is, the concept here is the consequences of Seven Lies. Yeah. Um, and this, I, I think that this is a, a very clever novel because it's a very gradual process of, the reader, dawning on the reader, what they're, what's going on here. It appears to be at first a novel about friendship. It's, it's about a devoted friendship, two, two girls who've known each other from earliest days, um, who is each other's best friend. Uh, it, it starts initially to feel almost like an Elena Ferrante novel about friendship. And then gradually, gradually we see the true nature of what's going on here. Uh, unreliable narrator, um, and, and the consequence of these, these single lies one at a time that pile up into a much greater deception. Uh, and at the end, when we understand really what's going on, it's, it's a really chilling end because it's not the ending that I expected. Uh, and it, it, it leaves so many unanswered questions for the reader to ponder, not unanswered questions in terms of events, but unanswered questions in terms of moral judgments and how you move forward from things. And it's well written. It's, 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 it's really engaging, I think. I found it uh, 
uh, I found it a cut above the rest of the domestic suspense novels that crossed my desk this year. Um, and, it, and it does um, explore female friendship, I think, in a very interesting way. And very impressive structure, because um, mm -hmm. we, we've talked about this before as well, that it's slightly surprising how much fiction is still written in a way that, you know, Jane Austen might recognise that it's a third person viewpoint right through the book, linear narrative. So it is always exciting when you find um, a, uh, a structural experiment that works. Yes, and the, the proof, as you can see here, comes with these mm. coloured sections. It's almost like um, a, a file folder. Yeah. So uh, it's very cleverly, very cunningly done. Um, you know, so obviously when, when all these proofs arrive through the door, uh, sometimes a book just attracts you because the cover's interesting. Mm. Um, but a lot of these I, I read um, as, as I read digitally, I read electronically. It's only later that the, the physical proof turns up. So I try not to judge a book by its cover, but uh, publishers have become increasingly uh, inventive about how they market books, uh, both to us uh, early influencers and to the public. Uh, and that's, that's interesting. It's, it's, it's almost as if they were inspired by the threats of digital and audio books into making books a lovely thing that we want to have and to hold. And we talked um, earlier about the consolation and pleasure in lockdown of crime fiction as travel taking you somewhere else. Your third choice, which is uh, Deepa Anapara's Dijun Patrol on the Purple Line. We, at the moment, as I understand it, it's slightly different uh, in Scotland and England, but we couldn't get on a plane and go to India, or at least not very easily. Um, so, uh, but this book takes us there. Yes, and it takes us uh, to a very, very particular kind of, of India. Um, I, I have to say that I want to show people the book here because uh, when you say it, gin patrol, people think, oh, it's, it's gin o'clock, let's all pour a gin and tonic. <laughs> um, but this is, this is a very, very long way from, from that, uh, that kind of thing. The front cover, I think, is great on the proof as yeah. well. It's like, um, but this, is, um, this takes us to uh, this, a slum, basically, an, an Indian slum uh, where poor people, very, very poor people, live right on the edge of existence. Uh, and the central character in this is a nine-year-old boy. Uh, and he's got, he, he, there was there was elements of this that almost reminded me of Just William. He's got mm -hmm. that kind of cheeky uh, disregard for, for the rules and for authority, and he's got his little, little gang, the three of them. Um, and what basically happens is that in this, this ghetto, this, this place where a struggle is, is existence, uh, children start to disappear. It starts off with one of his classmates who goes missing. And he decides he's going to find his classmate against all the odds. Uh, and the adventures that, that they get into start off, it starts off as kind of a lighthearted game, but very quickly uh, becomes a much more dark and, and febrile and, and compromising situation. Uh, and again, we, we have an ending that, that has really no comfort in it. Uh, and it's, it's a tremendous read. The, the sense of place is, is really powerful. I mean, I, I kind of understood the nuts and bolts of living there uh, very quickly. Uh, and this great characters, you just want, you, you're rooting for them all the way through. Uh, and really well written as well. I really enjoyed this. Uh, the purple line is the metro line that's been built out to their suburb. Uh, and and almost, it's, like, it's almost like a magic carpet that can whisk them to places they can only dream of. Uh, this is, I think this is, a, this is one of those novels that is a great read, but also teaches you a lot about how other people live, teaches you about other lives. Again, not in a didactic, preachy kind of way, but just as an incidental way of, of giving you the kind of detail that you would include in a book that was set anywhere. But here, these details are very telling. And another thing this book raises, as well, is something that for decades at um, Harrogate and the Edinburgh Book Festival, we've discussed many of us, in, in, on many occasions, you and I have discussed it, which is the relationship between so-called literary fiction and so-called crime fiction, uh, which is seen as genre. Um, what's interesting about this is that it's, it's, sh it's shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Literature, which is seen as, in inverted commas, a literary prize. We've had many other examples recently, but it does seem finally those boundaries are breaking down. I think so, and it's not before time. 
Um, for a long time, those of us who, who read the best of crime fiction have known that uh, the proportion of really good crime novels is about the same as the proportion of really good literary novels. Um, and uh, the, the proportion that is not so very good is about the same also. Um, and really, it's... It's one of these things where, like, like all prejudices, it's rooted in ignorance. People go like, oh, I don't read crime fiction. Uh, and then you put one of the really good ones in their hands and they go, oh, I had no idea. Mm. Uh, and I think that's really what's been happening. People uh, have been uh, perhaps been more open-minded. Uh, and also uh, there are, are, are literary, so-called literary writers, who are finding that uh, they can usefully uh, write a crime novel uh, and it's a good way of telling a story. And goodness me, does to help the sales. <laughs> well, very interesting example, which I think you would acknowledge, is Ian McEwan, where all of his later and most successful novels, um, well, not all of them, but a large number of them, if we look at Enduring Love or Saturday, um, or indeed um, even Nutshell, which is Hamlet. I don't know how to describe this. Um, Hamlet is a prenatal murder story, um, effectively. Um, they use uh, crime plots, and we know why, as you say, because they give you a propulsive narrative. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, people... The, the literary novel went through a phase of, of being more concerned with literary theory than with satisfying readers. Uh, and I think they gradually understood that, that people, people want to be told stories. I, I think as human beings, we're hardwired for narrative. Uh, it's how we communicate with each other. You know, you, you, you go home of an evening and you're asked, how was your day? And you don't go, well, I got the number 27 bus at 33 minutes past eight this morning. You go, was this amazing woman on the bus this morning? Everything we do, we, we transform into narrative. And we want stories that have a beginning and a middle and an end. That We may not produce them in that order on the page or in the telling. But essentially, if you break it down, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for narrative satisfaction all the time. And the crime novel, by its very nature, is geared up to provide that kind of narrative satisfaction. And I'm very happy to be writing in this genre at a time when it has become so expansive and so inclusive. Um, and really, I think that we are reaching a point where these, these terms of, of genre are... are not really relevant any longer. We're, and also the other thing is that in that period when the literary novel was, was um, busily staring up its own Foucault, um, we started to take over the space, if you like, of writing the social narrative, very much so. So in the 1980s, writers like John Harvey and a different way, P.D. James, with Rendell, Ian Rankin, myself, we were trying to write about the society we were living in and write about the world that we were operating in. Uh, and that kind of has become the default of contemporary crime fiction. We're writing novels of social realism. And I do believe that in, in the same way that now people go to Charles Dickens if they want a sense of Victorian England, in a hundred years time, they will come to the crime novel for a sense of what was happening at this part of the 20th century, not just here, but throughout Europe and America and, and elsewhere in the wider world, uh, because that's what we're writing against. We're writing against the, the, the society that exists, not against some science fiction village of St. Mary Mead. And indeed, um, yeah, but even in that, you see, it's interesting. A historian said to me that they found Agatha Christie really useful because, because crime fiction depends on detail, and so bus timetables and train timetables and what a train looked like and what people wore and what were they wearing, they give you um, an astonishing level of social detail, which literary fiction, again, often doesn't because you don't ha it's not relevant or it's not necessary to say what someone looked like or which train they got. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm uh, planning my next novel to be set uh, in, in the recent past. And, and what I've been doing is immersing myself in the fiction of that year and the year before, because it's exactly what you say, the descriptions of the clothes and the rooms and what people were driving uh, and how much the income tax was and, yeah. and how much a pint of beer cost, stuff like that is, is, is all, that, all those sort of details are, are there in the crime novel. And your fourth choice for New Blood 2020, um, you're in London, sorry, I'm in London, you're in Edinburgh. One of the greatest places in between is Newcastle. And um, uh, this book is set there, Trevor Wood, The Man on the Street. Yeah. And this is uh, a book that deals, uh, again, very, very much with uh, an issue of our time, but it's not a book that's about an issue. 
The central character of, of this book, uh, Jimmy, is homeless and he lives on the street in Newcastle uh, and he witnesses a murder one night and he is drawn into trying to find out the truth of what happened on that, the, on that occasion. And this place is in great danger uh, and it takes us to a side of, of our urban life that we don't generally see very much. Um, I've done various things with, uh, with homeless charities and I'm very involved in the Homeless World Cup. Uh, I'm putting together an anthology for that at the moment, which uh, will be available on Kindle only on July the 5th. This is the short commercial break. It's called Home <laughs> Fixtures. It's got 20 odd uh, stories and poems about football and homelessness from top name writers such as Denise Meyer, Ian Rankin, Chris Brookmeyer, Nick Hornby, Jackie Kay. So anyway, £1.99. Well, I'm going to buy one back. <laughs> no, no, sorry. But anyway, we're talking about, uh, about Trevor Wood's wonderful uh, novel, The Man on the Street. And I thought this was a, a, a gripping uh, story. Obviously, you're drawn into this because of the character of Jimmy, uh, who, although he's, he's on the streets, he's homeless, he's still uh, a functioning member of society, if you like, in the sense that, you know, his brain still works just fine. He knows his plight, he understands his plight. And he has his own group of comrades uh, that he's got different sorts of relationships with, as we all have different relationships with the people around us in our lives. And so it's still a novel that we uh, connect to very directly because this isn't a novel about issues, as I said, this is a novel about people, about characters, and about people at the edge, and about the dangers of, of uh, our city lives that we don't see because our eyes are averted. You know, as the Pet Shop Boys song goes, you know, we're the bums you step over as you leave the theatre. Mm. Um, and so this is the... This is, the invisible life, if you like, uh, and I think this uh, explores that invisible life very powerfully and very clearly. Uh, and again, written with great empathy and written really well. And, and again, with the humour as well uh, that uh, characterises, I think, often the best of crime fiction that, that takes the darkest things and finds a shaft of light in them. And I was also very struck, there's an interesting set of books at the moment. You mentioned unreliable narrators earlier. There's a set of books that involve what I would call a medically unreliable narrator. So you have Girl on the Train, where we don't know if we can trust the narrator because of drinking. We have Elizabeth is Missing, in which effectively, brilliantly played by Glenda Jackson, who's up for a BAFTA in the TV version, but um, in which the effective detective uh, can't remember things because of dementia. So isn't sure what she's remembered and what she's forgotten. But in this, we have a variant, don't we? Because, um, or indeed, Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night uh, time, where the, again, the investigator um, is uh, on the autism spectrum. Um, this is another example because uh, it's, it's post-traumatic stress disorder. So we can't ever be quite sure how reliable the perceptions and reactions of the central character are. That's right. Um, and PTSD is, is something that I think has only relatively recently been recognised uh, as its prevalence. Uh, not just people who have been in war zones, but people who have been, if you like, in domestic war zones um, and people whose jobs take them into uh, emotional and physical uh, storms, if you like. Uh, and we're gradually starting to understand how this, this affects us. And so I think it's, it's again, it's, it's an important element of the book that we are not sure always how reliable what Jimmy remembers is and, and what comes from his, his altered state, if you like, because of what his experiences have done to him. And of course, like so many people on the streets, he is there essentially because of PTSD, because of what has happened to him that has made it impossible for him to, to carry on his family life, to carry on his job, uh, to, to manage in the, the, the structured way that society expects of us. And I suspect that uh, post-COVID, we're going to see a lot more of this a lot more of people who have been pushed to the edge and beyond by the circumstances in which they found themselves. So, you know, in that sense, this is, this is a book that will, will uh, perhaps help us to understand what those people are going through. Well, and indeed, and anyone who is watching this uh, needs to uh, seek help if they're feeling anything like this, but anyone who knows, has relatives or knows anyone who's a doctor, they talk about that. I mean, the the mental and psychological consequences of COVID have been huge for many people. Yeah. And I've written, I mean, I've touched on the effects of PTSD in the Tony and Carol novels, uh, particularly the last couple. Um, and, and it is something that, that just, just 
destroys lives. Uh, and if it's not if it's not dealt with, if it's not dealt with sensitively by people who know what they're doing, uh, it it's it's dismissed. It's ignored. Uh, it's just someone being difficult. It's it's just someone not managing whatever. It's it's one of those things that uh, we're often very quick to dismiss and not take seriously enough. And again, I, I hope that's something that's going to to change and that will be taken seriously. And. An invidious question, obviously, and you, um, an amazing number of uh, writers you've brought forward through this. Um, are, are there particular writers you're um, pleased to have brought to people's attention through New Blood? Dozens, really. I mean, really. I, I think um, I think they should just post a list of, of, of New Blood on the website permanently mm -hmm. so that people can find uh, new authors that they've not tried before. But um, in recent years, there's, there's been some, some remarkable uh, success, like Jane Harper, mm -hmm. uh, Abir Mukherjee, Daryl McTiernan, uh, Will Dean. Uh, and then going further back, there's people like Stuart McBride, Belinda Bauer. Um, it's, it's been an amazing privilege to... to be there at the start of these writers' careers. And the other great advantage of it is I never have to buy a drink. <laughs> yeah. Um, to finish where we started with um, COVID, we've been talking about the fact that, as I say, apparently people are reading more th crime, mystery, thriller fiction. During the conversation, it just occurred to me that one of the attractions is that um, we're in this open-ended narrative, which it's often impossible to see the way out of, um, and I think clearly if people are reading more of the, the genres, um, it's because they do, they organize the world, don't they? I mean, there is, uh, there is a solution. Yeah, I think that's right. I think, uh, there is, there is a sense in which, um, the world has turned upside down, but you can see a way through to the end. And in a way, that's more true almost of the thriller than the traditional crime novel, because the, the thriller relies on the world turned upside down, the threat of losing everything that's dear to you, in a way that perhaps the crime novel isn't quite so directly concerned with. But yeah, those, those prospects of, of finding a way out, and heaven knows we're all looking for uh, an idea of what the way out from this is going to be. Um, for people like me, I mean, I feel very very privileged, very cocooned. You know, I, I, I live in a house that has a garden. There's lots of nice places to walk around in Edinburgh. You know, thankfully, because everybody's buying more books, my, my economic future is not threatened at this particular point. I've been very privileged, but I'm well aware of the lives around me that are disintegrating uh, because they've lost their jobs, they've lost their homes, their family lives have been damaged almost beyond repair, domestic violence is on the increase. All of these are, are consequences that are just below the surface for the lives that people like you and me lead, Mark. Uh, and that's gonna have a profound impact on the future. And I really wish I could have a clearer sense of where this is going to take us. But I know it's gonna be an interesting journey in the, the Chinese sense of may you live in interesting times. And we should finish on this that um, even the most pessimistic predictions would suggest surely we, we have to at least hope that we will be talking to each other in person next July in Harrogate and meeting readers. Yes, I hope so. Um, I mean, the scientists are working flat out. Uh, my, my old college, St Hilda's at Oxford, is, is closely involved in this. We have the, the chair of clinical pharmaceuticals uh, based in St Hilda's. And, you know, I, I hear um, little bits of reports of how things are progressing. And, you know, if, there will be a vaccine at some point and there will be an antibody test that will allow those of us who have, have had the disease to say, look, here's my certificate. I've had it. I'm safe. Um, and and things, things will move back towards... Uh, the kind of connectivity we had before, but how we actually live that life is another question. Are we just going to fall back into the old ways or are we actually going to learn some lessons from what we've been through? I hope that, that we can make changes. You know, I hope that, that we'll return to Harrogate next summer and it will be uh, a convivial occasion, standing outside, drinking our drinks in the, in the moonlight. Um, mm. And I hope that we have theatres, for heaven's sake, theatres. How are we going to have theatres? That grieves me. Um, but anyway, don't, don't get me started on all the things that, uh, that, that worry me and fret me. And how are we going to have another fun-loving crime writers gig? Um, but there will, be, there will be an afterwards, and it will be a different afterwards, but it will also be an afterwards that has its, its richness and its beauty. And also, you and I both wear glasses, so if we have any vision problems, I mean, Harrogate isn't that far from Barnard Castle, so we could... <laughs> 
we could yes. just pass ourselves out. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I do. I, I genuinely hope to see you um, and readers in Harrogate next year. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much to Val McDermott for this um, Harrogate International Crime Writing Festival 2020 event online, promoting her new blood choices, which you'll be able to find on the website. And as we said, are all available now. So if you want to do reading as we in lockdown or emerging from lockdown. Thanks very much, Val. And indeed, I will be uh, hosting a New Blood panel online with the four authors that, uh, that we've chosen for this. So you can actually see them in the flesh as opposed to hearing me blethering about them. <laughs> Thank you very much. And goodbye. Good Goodbye. Thanks for joining us. If you have enjoyed this event as part of the Harrogate International Festivals, please do think about a donation to ensure that our festivals can survive in the future. Donations can be made by texting HIF and the amount to 70085. For more events, please visit our online hub, the HIF Player. It's packed with upcoming live streams, events you've missed, archive recordings and much more.